research that shows that with the development of uh, technologies, that standard of living would also change. So after World War II, um, the United States became interested in uh, changing the standard of living of other countries uh, as sort of a, a defense mechanism uh, in a way, and because uh, much of Western Europe was so uh, completely destroyed um, after, uh, after the war. One measure f uh, that's used to understand uh, economic status or, or development is the gross domestic product. And you'll see when you look on the CIA World Factbook, if you look at that, there are several different uh, GDPs each looking at different aspects of the economy. But in general, um, it is the, the value of all the goods and services that a region produces. Um, and so that a high uh, GDP indicates a, con a country or a region that has a lot of economic development and economic power. Uh, we could call that a MDC or a more developed country and uh, a country or region with a, uh, a that is developing uh, would have a low GDP which would be an LDC or a less developed country or a developing country. It used to be uh, common to use the, wor the words uh, first world, second world, and third world and those really harken back to the post-World War II era where first world countries were considered to be democratic countries third world countries were considered more on the communist bloc and then second world countries were the ones that could be potentially moved uh, one way or another. This is an interesting map of gross domestic product. It's a cartogram um, and a cartogram uh, in this instance shows the size of the country um, either expanded or reduced to reflect the GDP or the or the the uh, value of the goods and services and so the, you see that the United States uh, can and uh, Alaska is huge uh, Japan is huge uh, you see uh, uh, the UK is huge and France is as very large other Western European countries are really large Africa is almost non-existent South America is very small and so you get this sense that uh, the the distribution of wealth in the world is not uh, not particularly even. Um, if you let me see if this link will open up. Um, this is the the World Bank is a global op, uh, op organization that um, the major goal is to really work with countries and regions with extreme poverty and so I wanted to show you a different map of GDP probably one that you're more used to seeing let me see if I can get this to show up yeah, there we go I'm gonna bring this over here so this is showing the gross domestic product of the world um, and the timeline is set to 2011-2015 and so again you can see um, they're using uh, per capita um, in US dollars for every person according to the World Bank uh, the light white or light pink is $240 per person and the very dark red um, is $163,000 per person that's the uh, if you spread all the wealth out this is what that would look like and you can really see that it's very unevenly distributed um, Australia the United States Canada uh, Western Europe um, has a much higher GDP than uh, much of the rest of the world so using that idea you can look at the world as just kind of developing uh, or developed, uh, more developed or less developed and it really kind of is a north-south split with this little bit of Australia um, showing up at the bottom. It's another map showing uh, prosperity. Um, so it, it took um, a little different bent and you can see it differentiates 
uh, many of the countries in Africa a little more than the just looking at the plain GDP. So it can, shows the top uh, 10 countries and the, and the bottom 10 countries where most of the bottom 10 countries are in, are in Africa. Um, so really get that idea that uh, economic development is not even. In the 60s, uh, Rustow developed a model of economic development that is written about and talked about quite a bit. And he uh, proposed the idea that uh, economic development happens in these predictable regular stages and that they're similar everywhere in the world. So that a country or a region would start out in this traditional stage where their economy is based on agriculture um, and their subsistence and then they go through these various stages of development um, each where there is uh, more sophistication in technology and more industrialization and they keep moving through these stages until they hit this final stage which he calls the age of high mass consumption and so the United States most of Western Europe are countries that are uh, would be considered in this stage of high mass consumption and this is a, a t uh, an economic stage where um, most people are not worried about their next meal that uh, that goods and services are are readily available and um, and that was his idea of of being able to understand uh, economic development across the world however there's some problems with this model um, it's very simple but the world is really not that simple especially today um, the first assumption that he made is that countries develop in isolation and that might have been true historically although when you even look at colonization uh, that probably takes that into account as well but today that global economy is so interconnected and so intertwined that Rastel's model um, does not really work at all um, Oh shoot! Something's covered up by my map here. I wanted to, I wanted to read to you. Um, so that's all right. We'll skip that part. Um, the second assumption is that a development is not interrupted. That people start traditionally and then they have this regular process up to development. Well, we do know that wars can set countries back. Um, there are times where one country might deliberately block the development of another country to stop competition. Um, Iraq was uh, sanctioned, um, were not able to develop its oil resources or ship its oil, so that would have stopped or uh, moved Iraq back economically. Um, same thing in North Korea. We have sanctions against North Korea developing uh, economically and participating in the global market and so um, that regular movement up the economic development track is not always realistic. The third assumption um, is that uh, everybody thinks and acts the same and that there are no differences culturally or regionally and we know that's not true. Um, there are many countries who uh, that goal of um, that stage of age of high mass consumption may never be the goal for that country. Uh, they may be looking at um, higher wages, uh, longer uh, parental leave, uh, factories that are safer and all of that would would take money out of people's pockets in in a way to make the lives their lives a little different or their work life different would impact the economy. So uh, Rostow's model is talked about quite frequently. It's an interesting one. It simplifies and gives a great general picture of, the, of economic development, but it really doesn't talk about all the different ways that that development can be either assisted or retarded or reduced. So when we talk about um, economics and the economy, we have to think about the activities that people are doing um, and I mentioned early primary or agricultural activities. So we tend to talk about um, economic uh, services or sectors as primary, 
secondary and then service sectors. And historically, service sectors can be subdivided into uh, tertiary, quaternary, or quinary, or this idea of transportation and money. So let's look at primary in industries first. Uh, primary industries are industries where there is an extraction of natural resources. So um, fishing, farming, um, timber, mining, um, oil extraction, all of these would be uh, industries where materials are being, being taken uh, from from the earth and those resources are um, typically removed gathered and sent somewhere as is as is as they are um, and and most of these activities today are happening in countries that we would consider uh, developing countries and there's um, a very distinct landscape for primary industries um, here's an, an example of uh, iron ore industry of, oh, I hate when that happens, iron extraction. Um, here's an example of ore extraction. Um, so you can see that, um, you know, in a landscape where you have a lot of primary activity, you could have a lot of environmental um, degradation, uh, deforestation, erosion, um, increase in uh, landslides because you've removed uh, root capacity and, and root storage, um, increase in temperature as you uh, remove trees so the whole global warming or uh, global climate change concern as a result of primary industries pollutants in the air um, the second uh, industry type is secondary industries sometimes people think of it more comfortably just as manufacturing and this is when those primary um, uh, primary resources were uh, worked in some way in some factory so that there is an added value um, and this was kind of a major stage when we look at the Industrial Revolution um, where this began to happen on a uh, conveyor belt or a mass uh, processing uh, situation so um, this is when you take that, dig that ore out and, and smelt it into steel or timber uh, turns uh, raw logs into dimensioned into dimension lumber where fish is caught but then turned into frozen or canned cotton into shirts. Um, and so that you've taken that raw material and you've added some value to that material and it's worth a lot more because you've done something with it. You've made it into something that will store longer, be used in a different way. And the landscape of uh, secondary industries is also pretty uh, striking. So here is the primary industry of oil, oil extraction. This is the secondary industry show, showing an oil refinery. Um, just think of the huge infrastructure, the amount of electricity, the amount of water, um, the roads that have to come in, uh, the people that are working there, uh, the pollutants from um, the smokestacks, uh, these, these have a huge impact on the landscape. Um, so we looked a second ago at the ore uh, primary industry and here is an example of uh, the secondary industry where that those raw uh, rocks and, and minerals are, are melted, smelted, and, and produced into steel. Again, a lot of electricity, a lot of power, a lot of water, a lot of waste. You end up with tailings and things that have to be carted and removed and, and something done with. Um, the other example is just the difference in um, the raw logs and dimensional lumber. And in, in Oregon there was a, a case or a situation uh, several years ago where we had been uh, were beginning to ship 
logs uh, uh, to Japan, let me restate that, um, Japan wanted us to ship raw logs uh, to Japan and they would mill the logs into dimensioned lumber um, using, I think they were using metric at that time and all of their building standards were metric and we were doing US standard, you know, feet um, and inches. And so um, it was very expensive for US factories to restructure so that they could mill the logs to meet the needs for Japanese, uh, the Japanese industry. But to sell raw logs or just to sell the uncut, the undimensioned lumber was a huge loss to the, to the whole timber industry. And so there was a lot of concern about how do we get, uh, we want to, we want to be the ones who take that, the, take those logs and turn them into uh, dimensioned lumber rather than sell raw logs. And so when we looked at the maps earlier, we saw that overall there's a very uneven uh, development across the world. Um, part of this has been because of global geographic shifts and globalization that we've talked about throughout the term. Um, we have companies who have their headquarters in, in one area where they're maybe uh, making decisions, but the uh, manufacturing is happening in another country from resources that they're getting, uh, primary resources in, an, in another country. Um, and so this shift, this globalization and movement of uh, resources and people has created a deindustrialization in some areas of the world. Uh, and we'll look at that in a minute, and also created these multinational corporations or transnational corporations. Uh, right now um, in the news there's been a lot of talk about um, U.S. Uh, drug manufacturing companies moving their headquarters to other countries because uh, it would be cheaper taxes for them. So this is an example of um, that industrial landscape. Uh, I think that slide was out of place, but you get the idea. Um, we've got canneries that are taking fish and turning it into some added value. We have uh, textile plants who are taking cotton, turning it into thread, or turning the th weaving the thread into some kind of garment. Um, steel industries and timber industries. The second type of industry then is the services um, and services are subdivided into three or four other types. We're going to look at the transportation communication industry um, which is changing dramatically with telecommunications, internet uh, movement of information. But this is basically the, the transportation, the utilities, uh, the connection of the product to the consumer. How do you get um, that television from uh, Juarez up to uh, Portland, Oregon to be purchased? Um, so it, with, with the services industry, they're just moving the materials from one place to the other. There's no actual creation uh, of those materials. And that, too, is a huge impact on the landscape. So we think about um, many of our highway transportation systems. The uh, Right now, we can have uh, three uh, semis with three trucks uh, in in pulling materials, uh, huge container ships um, moving across the planet, uh, air transportation, and then these large telecommunication towers going everywhere in order to move the material, the ideas. Uh, you know, you, you, you can't just send the container ship. You need some kind of telecommunications that's tracking that material, that's uh, invoicing it, that's making sure that uh, the receiver and the sender are connected and know what's coming and when and where it is. So it's a huge, huge aspect um, of, of the economic sector. And developed countries are 
functioning much more in these service industries than in the primary and secondary industries. And this is one of the reasons they talk about um, retraining the workforce because many developed countries don't have manufacturing, uh, don't have jobs in the primary extraction industry anymore. The jobs, the, the majority of the jobs are in these services, whether it be transportation or producer services. So these are the, the specialized services um, in banking, insurance, uh, um, wholesale, um, again the high tech uh, and so this is really who's who's running um, all of the the industries and currently in the United States about 65 percent of our economy is coming from that sector uh, of business and it too has a very dramatic landscape. Um, this is the city of Rio de Janeiro and you see high-rise uh, buildings. You see um, a lot of uh, urban area infrastructure. Here's another one in Singapore. Very modern city. Um, this is where you would see uh, the majority of uh, producer services, uh, banking, insurance, retail, wholesale happening. Seoul, Korea, the Nine Towers of Seoul, Korea. Again, major, major producer industry and in our very own US, Chicago, and in Bogota, Colombia. All of these are the landscapes of this sector, uh, very developed countries and landscapes. One aspect of, um, of this sector of the economy is the development of these high-tech corridors. corridors. Um, and here is the classic Silicon Valley. Um, all of the high-tech industries uh, are you know, in these areas together. And, and on a smaller scale, this really creates a lot of un, uneven development, uh, even in, in a country or a region. These places are now really super expensive. Uh, most people who are working in um, transportation industry or in any manufacturing cannot afford to live uh, near, near these places where they might work. The last uh, sector of the economy is the service, or is the consumer services, and these are, you know, services that are delivered to the general pu public. So these are kind of the advancements, uh, research, education, health, medicine, and tourism. And in the U.S., uh, we we have about 10 percent of our economy um, in these aspects. So kind of then backing up a little bit um, in. In the 18th century, 